Hey, good afternoon. How's it going? I'm Lieutenant Commander Andy Baldwin. I'm a Navy physician and just back from a very incredible trip to uh, Kenya over in uh, Africa where I spent uh, about a month's time and then came back here and I ran a marathon yesterday and then scooted down here to DC to be part of a really innovative uh, social media experiment, if you will. And I, I want to uh, welcome everybody who's following along live stream today and uh, welcome your questions. So uh, just before we get to that though, I want to give an overview of what uh, Navy medicine is, why I joined the Navy, and why you should care. Uh, so if you might not know this, but 70% of the Earth's surface is water, and 80% of the world's population lives near the water, and then 90% of all the cargo and the uh, commerce that goes around the world happens through the water. So if that waterway isn't safe, then, uh, then we're not safe, then you're not safe, then you're not getting uh, what you need. And that's what the Navy does, what it's, why it's really important that we keep those secure waterways throughout the world. Uh, so that's the, one of the Navy's main missions is being out there, forward presence, uh, deterrence, so that people like pirates aren't interrupting the flow of commerce. If there's a wartime that you're uh, not going to take on the United States because we have a forward presence over there. Navy medicine is actually a six billion dollar enterprise. I don't think many people realize that. Six billion dollars. There's 63,000 healthcare members as part of the Navy medicine team and we take care over one million eligible beneficiaries. That's all sailors, Marines, uh, and their families, and then also veterans who've, uh, who've served uh, our country uh, so gallantly. So I made the decision when I was a, a high school student to uh, go to ROTC at Duke to get my commission as a Naval officer, and then also I got a scholarship to medical school to become a Navy physician and subsequently went on to become a Navy diver, a diving medical specialist, and developed a true love for doing humanitarian assistance missions and taking care of our sailors and Marines. So I hope that gives you a somewhat of an umbrella uh, understanding of what Navy medicine does. Now, how, do, how the heck did I end up in Kenya? You probably are wondering that. Well, back in 2004, a tsunami occurred in Southeast Asia and uh, we hadn't been very proactive before we had been responding to uh, some disaster relief as, as the Navy uh, but in this case the uh, US hospital ship Mercy went and responded and what we saw was the impact that this had on people's hearts and minds and how they viewed the uh, United States Navy and how they viewed the United States. And so one of the key parts of our maritime doctrine for the Navy and the Marine Corps team and the Coast Guard became uh, what we call manning, training, and equipping our force to not just respond when there is a disaster, but to uh, train to provide humanitarian assistance throughout the world. So I'm a third year resident in family medicine at Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And it's wonderful because one of our months that we're there, we have the option to do a full out rotation somewhere in the world. And I chose to go to Kenya, to a very remote and rural area there, where I operated in austere environments and trained for just the type of humanitarian assistance or disaster relief mission that is a core part of our Navy medicine mission as part of uh, uh, taking care of uh, our sailors and Marines and, uh, and their families and uh, really uh, going after that key mission of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, if you don't train for it, then when it happens, you're not ready to do it. So that's what I was doing in Kenya and uh, it's been an incredible experience and I'm happy to take your questions. We have an incredible team here right now that's going to be providing them to me. So. Uh, ask away. Anything that you want to know about the Navy, Navy Medicine, Dr. Andy Baldwin, 
Uh, it's cool to be here, and I and, uh, hope you continue to stay with us. Our lady Paula is very interested to know uh, about your trip to Kenya, and she knows that you brought a lot of knowledge to the Kenyans, but what is the one thing they taught you? So Paula is wondering uh, what the Kenyans taught me. I went over there and provided a lot of uh, medical care and education. But, you know, the one thing that I, uh, I really took away from Kenya, uh, Paula, is the level of respect that those people have over there and how they operate as a true community and taking care of each other. They have very little resources and... Uh, a lot of them have suffered from HIV AIDS and passed away, have suffered from malaria. Uh, and they don't, if, if you pass away and you die and you can't eat, that's just the kind of the way it goes. It's not, life is valued in a different type of way over there just based on the resources you have. So in order to really um, solve that, I, I believe the area, at least where I was, you know, the sense of community there was tremendous. And I went and I spoke to groups of students and these high school students just sat there completely poised and uh, you know, that would never would have happened in the United States and every everywhere I went uh, passing by cows and goats and sheep you're expected to shake a stranger's hand and if you pass by somebody without greeting them it's seen as a, a sign of disrespect so uh, they really taught me a, a lot about the sense of community and and frankly, it brought me back to uh, the days when, when I grew up in Pennsylvania in farmland there. So thanks for your question, Bala. Susan uh, would like to know, is it possible for other Navy doctors to do rotations in remote areas where medical attention is needed? Susan asks uh, whether it's possible for others to do rotations like I did in uh, Navy medicine. Absolutely. That's why... Uh, I joined Navy Medicine, and uh, that's why I'm talking with you today to tell you how you can do these rotations in uh, remote areas. As part of other medical school training programs, uh, sure, it could be uh, possible, but I've been to over 40 countries now throughout the world providing uh, medical care, uh, serving the United States Navy as a Navy physician. and. If you wanted to stay in one place and not move around and not have these international experiences, uh, don't join Navy Medicine. If you want to have those opportunities, absolutely. Uh, come our way, and uh, uh, you'll be glad you did. Question about whether I had spent any time on our Navy Medicine hospital ships. And uh, indeed I have. I, I deployed with the U.S. hospital ship Comfort uh, in 2009 to Haiti, Central America, and South America. Uh, actually, just prior to when the Comfort responded to the crisis in Haiti after the earthquake. So it's exactly why we do these type of missions. The fact that we were able to go and respond so quickly uh, to the crisis in Haiti was due to the mission that uh, I was part of in 2009. And, and let me tell you why it's so crucial. And it, it helps us back here in the United States as well from a public health standpoint. When I was down in Nicaragua and Colombia and El Salvador, the types of diseases that I was seeing down there are things that I just read about in textbooks that you very rarely see here in the United States. And so as healthcare providers, being exposed to that and having that experience and treating that and bringing that knowledge back to the United States is crucial. And in further uh, crises that come up, us as Navy healthcare providers, uh, having that knowledge base now, we're more adept at treating uh, these type of illnesses. And I, no, nowhere did I see that more than in Kenya this past month. The number of malaria cases that I treated, the HIV AIDS, uh, the parasites that so many of the patients that I saw had, uh, a lot of kids didn't have any shoes, and the route that certain infections can penetrate uh, animal-borne illnesses, rabies and brucellosis that you get from cows. All these things were just very eye-opening to me uh, to see. And uh, it's why I love Navy medicine so much, that 
you get such a breadth of experience. It's not the same old things that you would see in the U.S. Uh, in a common medical practice. So uh, thanks for being with us. And we're going to have another question right now. Gabby? Um, Kevin would like to know, what would you tell med students finishing school who are unsure about choosing family medicine as a specialty? So what would I tell medical students that are finishing school about choosing family medicine as a specialty? Well, I'm a big family medicine fan. Obviously, I'm a family medicine resident, and I didn't always used to be that way. I actually came out of medical school, and I wanted to be a surgeon. I did my internship in general surgery at the Naval Hospital in San Diego, uh, and then it was really my operational experience after that internship that opened my eyes to the uh, the true benefits of being a family physician. All the humanitarian assistance missions that I did, the, uh, the breadth of care that you can provide as a primary care provider and how much I loved the continuity of care, seeing my patients uh, come back and get better and how gratifying that was. That's why I chose family medicine. And uh, as a family medicine doctor in the, in the Navy, the things that you can do uh, are wide reaching. You can be a physician that helps people serve underwater, on ships on the water, up in the air. You can be on a battlefield with, with the Marines. You can be in hospital settings. Uh, you can be very intensive in maternal and child care. And you also do, can do a lot of global health work uh, from a public health standpoint. So if you're looking for a lot of different options, uh, you're someone that may get bored easily doing just one thing, family medicine's for you. And the best family medicine training programs around are in the Navy. Trust me. All right, next. Summers would, uh, is asking, how do you prepare emotionally to deal with such an intense experience as yours in Kenya recently? I'm traveling with a team to Ethiopia in a few months. What should we prepare ourselves for? So how am I doing emotionally right now? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, coming from living in a mud hut for a month in rural Kenya and seeing the type of things that I did every day um, and then going and running back-to-back -back marathons and uh, jetting down here today and uh, back to the United States where there is uh, definitely a some culture shock and, and uh, hey I wanted to give a plug out uh, to the Wounded Warrior hiring conference, which is going to be live streaming tomorrow, uh, excuse me, Wednesday, Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. So the Wounded Warrior hiring conference, check that out. Uh, the question before we uh, went down was about how someone should prepare emotionally for a trip to a third world country, a, a developing nation where you're really going to see um, some pretty emotionally challenging things. And I definitely am readjusting getting back to the United States uh, it, you know, wh however you can deal with it by uh, by writing it out by talking to people but there's definitely a lot of what we call compassion fatigue that can occur uh, when you see some of the uh, unfortunate things in impoverished areas and I think the thing that you uh, can best do to prepare yourself to go over uh, is Go over it with an open mind and try to not go over with such an uh, American mindset that your definitive medical care will be provided. Uh, you know, these are different countries. You're, you're uh, largely visitors in, in, uh, in these areas, and uh, you need to realize that they don't have the same type of health care systems that we do. And really, it's that perspective that you gain, uh, you know, which you come back with a completely different uh, uh, almost paradigm shift on the way that you view uh, our lives here in, in the United States. And having that experience as a Navy physician, a Navy healthcare provider is, I think, crucial to be able to operate in times of need when we are on humanitarian assistance missions or on disaster relief missions. And uh, I uh, definitely, even just talking about it right now helps me to, to process a lot of what I saw and did over there. Uh, hey, you know, I got to give a shout out to Navy Corpsman. Uh, I just took the taxi over here from the train station in D.C. And you, know, you, you never know where you're going to find someone that's been a, a Navy veteran. This guy was a Navy Corpsman. 
I was telling him I was coming over to do this, and he's sporting a, a Navy cap, and on the side it says Global Force for Good. Uh, you know, Navy is everywhere, and it, it's uh, something that you can immediately connect to and have a dialogue with. That's what it means to be part of the Navy and Marine Corps team. And uh, so I just got to give a shout out. You know, Go Navy, Global Force for Good. All right, we'll go to the next question now. Okay, Jonathan asks, could you discuss the dual mission of Navy healthcare uh, and the warfighter role, as well as the humanitarian role and how the Navy uses healthcare to spread the message of peace and hope? Great question from Jonathan about there's a dual role that we have as a Navy in uh, war fighting uh, and, and then also uh, the humanitarian element from uh, uh, going over and making friends and providing peace. And it's the Navy medicine standpoint, we take care of the sailors and Marines that are out there on the battlefield, that are in submarines, that are on ships, that are in the air, protecting them, taking care of them if they get injured. And then the medical diplomacy side is where we go out and we help to instill a, a sense of security by providing health care to those in need. And by so doing, you gain trust and there's more order and there's less propensity for terrorism. And by creating a, a stronger, secure world and by making friends, that's what I love. It's a, what we call a soft power and it's what we're doing more and more of uh, in Navy medicine. Great question, Jonathan. Uh, I take it that you probably have some Navy medicine experience and uh, good on you. Uh, Courtney wants to know who, uh, what uh, personalities, who, your, who was your favorite person to run with at the marathon in New York yesterday? Who was my favorite person to run with in New York yesterday? Uh, you know, actually, it, you know, between Mario Lopez and Apollo Ono, I mean, Apollo is a great friend of mine, and you know, he came out there and he ran, ran a heck of a race. But the Jenny Finch, who's the Olympic softball player, actually started dead last, and. And then every person that she passed, she uh, gave some money to charity for. And so she, I think she passed upward of uh, like 25,000 people. So I didn't actually run with her, but I thought that uh, that concept of starting last and doing it for charity was, uh, was really cool. So uh, 50, close to 50,000 people ran in New York yesterday. And so it was, a, it was an honor to be out there. And uh, I was running for charity. And thanks for that question. Uh, and Mike, who also is a uh, triathlete, says his Achilles left foot is crackly and wants to know what the causes may be. Mike, you're a triathlete and you have a left crackly ankle or Achilles. Hey, man, you need to join Navy Medicine or join the Navy so that I can see you as my patient and then I'll take care of you. All right. Sound like a plan? Uh, Lucy would like to know uh, how you were able to culturally connect with the Kenyans during your recent trip. So a big part of Kenya is obviously their culture, their beliefs, and you know, they, a lot of it was just being open-minded. Uh, again, I lived in a mud hut for a month. I ate ugali pretty much every meal, which is their, uh, from their corn flour mixed with mixed with water and I also sang a lot of songs with them. I tried to you know, show the utmost respect. They're very ceremonial in everything that they do and I also love to run with them. Believe it or not, every, everybody runs there. As much as we try to promote health and exercise here in this country, you don't need to do that over there because every kid as soon as they can walk is running and so every morning I would get up and go running and even the cows over there run so uh, those are some of the cultural things I was able to embrace over in Kenya and um, I, I uh, also tried to teach them some of our American culture uh, most importantly uh, how we as healthcare providers in the United States truly take the Hippocratic Oath and will provide medical care no matter whether they, you can pay for it or not. It was one of the things that I got pretty uh, upset about over there was uh, their, uh, if you can't pay for medical care, eh, 
it's tough and uh, you won't get it and a lot of you see a lot of people die so that's probably the hardest thing I dealt with when I was over there uh, Susie was, has asked about uh, healthy lifestyles you do a lot of work with children in the US regarding healthy healthy lifestyles how much of that was translatable to the Kenyan children you worked with a uh, great question from Susie about the healthy lifestyles and here in the United States versus overseas. And uh, it's, it's, that's an interesting question because uh, here I've done a lot, you know, childhood obesity is an epidemic here in the United States and the amount of chronic disease we're seeing in, it, in our children at an early age, heart disease, diabetes, uh, it's just disastrous. And so I, I speak a lot on the importance of physical activity, uh, a healthy diet, and you know, that's something that's very important for our uh, sailors, Marines, and their families as well. It's what I talk to all my patients about each and every day I see clinic. Now going over there to, the, to Kenya, I was in a very rural area and a place where, as I mentioned, kids are running everywhere they go and where everything that they eat is not processed. It's grown very fresh. And so here I was in front of a group of hundreds of students and what I usually would talk about, about, hey, you need to be active. Hey, you need to eat healthier. I couldn't really say that. And uh, it put me in an interesting position, uh, one, of how to describe the kids in the United States. But uh, you know, what I could talk to them about is the importance of believing in themselves. I, just a little thing like a pair of shoes or talking to somebody, having someone talk to them that you can believe in yourself. Here's the way you need to be healthy, to wear shoes, to uh, practice good hygiene, to drink clean water, providing those things and then getting an education. Those are the things that are going to lead to their ability to, to, uh, uh, to realize their dreams, to succeed. Uh, and so it was definitely a different dichotomy in an impoverished area. Uh, you see a much different uh, approach to talking to these children. So thanks for that question, Susie. And um, uh, if you're interested in Navy medicine, uh, please pursue that. Susan would be very interested to know what other areas of the world can Navy medical professionals uh, expect to have the opportunity to work as well? So Susan, anywhere there's water, even places where there isn't water, Navy medicine is there. You know, whether it's below the sea, on ships, up in the air, or with our Marine Corps team out on the battlefield. Uh, we have naval hospitals worldwide. Uh, I've been stationed in Hawaii. I've been over to Bahrain in the Middle East, Kuwait, uh, Italy, Japan, uh, all throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, and we also have a very, the majority of our forces of our Navy medicine team is here uh, stateside. Uh, the big three hospitals that we have are in San Diego, Portsmouth, Virginia, and here in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, near Washington, D.C. We also have regional hospitals, one of which I practice at in uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Uh, so that's one thing about Navy medicine. If you're up for it, if you want to travel the world, there's, uh, there's a place for you in Navy medicine. Uh, Varun would be interested to hear if there's any one aspect of Navy medicine you could change if you could. There's one aspect of Navy medicine that if I could change, I would. Uh, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I always say that the, the greatest decision I ever made in my life was joining the Navy. And uh, you know, I was a farm boy from Pennsylvania, hadn't traveled outside of the United States until I was 20 years old, and that's when I was with the Navy. And uh, since then, I've been, I've been to 40 countries. I've worked with the best team I've ever been a part of. The people that you meet in the Navy, uh, will, you'll be friends with for life. And uh, just the fact that I have been fortunate enough to be able to get an education, have it paid for uh, by the Navy, and then to serve my country, doing what I love, truly what I love is part of a, a, the, a global force for good. Uh, in these humanitarian assistance missions that I've been on. Um, if, the Navy, if Navy medicine will continue to send me and the other healthcare providers out there uh, practicing medical diplomacy, humanitarian assistance, uh, 
the more I can do that, the better. Brenda would be interested in hearing about what you're doing in the Navy today. So in the Navy today, I am a third year resident in our family medicine program. It's one of our academic training programs that is offered at the Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton out in Southern California. I have approximately uh, 10 months to go in that training program and then after that I will go on and serve in a capacity either on board ship with the Marine Corps team. Uh, I could be with a dive unit again. That, uh, I really don't know but I'm going to be talking with my detailer about that and uh, as long as it involves the uh, capacity to practice global health care on there. Mike has a question about uh, your thoughts on how Kenyans combat athletic injuries and produce so many great runners. Yeah, you know, the, the two top runners yesterday at New York City Marathon were uh, both named Mutai, Jeffrey, and then uh, he got first, smashed the course record, and then Emmanuel Mutai got second. And, you know, they, when I ran Nairobi Marathon last weekend, there were about 300 elite Kenyans in the uh, in the front pack and the the thing that produces uh, in my opinion these great Kenyan runners is that they're doing they've run uh, you know thousands of miles by the time they're you know, 10 years old they run everywhere they go it's their mode of transportation they don't have uh, cars they uh, they don't have motorcycles they uh, they walk for hours they walk and run for hours on end uh, as a means to survive and it's been known in their country and at altitude where they train that this is a way to uh, provide for your family to to uh, to succeed and uh, become a great runner and so that pride they have in running is uh, something that's almost instinctual there as part of their culture and uh, I love training with them they're the most gracious and and giving people and before I left I, I brought over four bags full of of uh, sneakers and soccer balls and uh, even my my watch I gave to uh, the nice boy Isaac who ran with me every morning that's what humanitarian assistance is all about is uh, you know they're gonna remember uh, somebody part of the, the US Navy team uh, that's been uh, helping them to live their best life uh. Donna asks, what, uh, what have you learned from your time on TV? And would you, uh, would you uh, go on TV again if you had the opportunity? Uh, what have I learned from being on TV? That's what Donna asks. Well, I, I went in, uh, as I said, a, a TV virgin. and I really didn't know what reality TV was all about. And I went on The, the Bachelor four years ago. And uh, from that, you, you learn a lot, uh, one, about yourself, about uh, how much editing they do after the fact, and uh, how important it is to uh, always project your uh, your your true self and uh, your true values. And if you live by your values and uh, you, know, you continue on that path, there might be a lot of things that happen in life. But uh, if you're able to project your thoughts and uh, and help others, going on TV and the public platform that it gave me has allowed me to do. Uh, a lot of good. Will I go on TV again? Not in a reality TV uh, uh, show type of way. If it's a documentary that highlights what we do as part of Navy medicine, as part of the team, Global Force for Good, absolutely I will. And if it's a documentary that helps with a public health issue, global health issue, absolutely I will. And I'm very, uh, I, I'm gracious and uh, you know, thankful for the time that I had on television. No regrets, uh, but I, I wouldn't do that type of show again. Uh, there's a question from Twitter about sailors uh, deployed around the world, especially ships and subs in uh, small environments. Any recommendations to remain uh, fit at sea? <laughs> it's tough. Uh, the question is about remaining fit at sea, and when you're on a Los Angeles cl uh, class submarine, which I've been uh, in the past, any space is, is, is very crucial. And so we actually will jam these stair climbers or treadmills into the engine room and you get the nuclear reactor right there and you're wearing your dosimeter, making sure that you're 
not getting too much radiation and the subs going this way and that and you're trying to stay on the treadmill and avoid that water pipe above your head. Uh, hey, if you're determined to do it, you can do it. Use a lot of stretch bands, uh, a lot of plyometric exercises, even running in place. And uh, you, it's tough. You, know, you don't have a, uh, a vast field or track where you can work out, obviously, on board a ship or a sub. But uh, if you're determined to do it, which you should be, uh, you can make it happen. Uh, Simone and hold on, I think we did. You're we have a off speed, but you're you're kind of you have calm. So. Okay. Simone and asks about uh, volunteering in Kenya. Uh, the main hurdle that she f dealt with was feeling like she couldn't help. Uh, she asks, I wonder if you ever feel like that, and how do you handle that situation? That's uh, a great question, Simone. About feeling of being helpless in uh, certain situations in Kenya. And I definitely felt that way. Uh, I can recall it one day especially where I had two patients that were gravely ill and needed healthcare attention at a hospital. And uh, the hospital there, uh, the doctors were on strike for uh, a variety of reasons. And uh, these patients didn't end up uh, making it. And uh, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the antibiotics at hand, we didn't have the, um, uh, what these patients needed to get, to get care. And uh, as a medical provider, uh, as a Navy doctor, I knew what we needed, but uh, just did not have those resources. And the, the structure that was there wasn't supporting us. And uh, that's a time where, again, you need to take yourself out of your... You know, mindset here in the uh, developed first world and realize that you know, this is the way things are here and, and sometimes you can't do everything. You can just do to the greatest of your ability with what you have at that present time. Uh, got a question from Navy intern. Uh, his question is, as a Navy intern about to be assigned as an undersea medical officer, are there opportunities to participate in humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions? Well, hey, uh, hoo I'll, I'll tell you that right now. You're uh, uh, going the right route as a undersea medical officer. That's what I did in uh, hoo Deep Sea. And uh, there always are opportunities in the Navy to do humanitarian assistance missions. And uh, you'll get there, and no matter where you choose to go, uh, I encourage you to talk to everybody around you and tell them that if a mission comes available, uh, that you're the man to do the job. You know, so seek it out and uh, make it be known, and uh, the opportunities will find you. I guarantee you there's a lot more opportunities to do humanitarian assistance missions within uh, Navy medicine than there are in the civilian world. Okay, on Twitter, Exercise Works uh, has asked, any chance you clever medics could design an easier way of giving adrenaline to arrests than IV? Interesting question. I, uh, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing uh, in terms of giving adrenaline uh, IV. I know there's other routes that are being looked at subcutaneously, uh, intramuscular, uh, endotracheal tubes. But what I can tell you is that we have a very robust uh, Navy Medical Research Center and so much of what comes out of what we see and treat on the battlefield or underwater or on ships or in the air is translated back in helping our medical care here in the United States. Now, for instance, the, the combat trauma care that the research that's come out of that is being used each and every day now in trauma centers around the United States. The malaria research uh, that we do through the Navy Medical Research Center is cutting edge and is helping to provide uh, malaria cures throughout the world. Uh, so if you're interested in research, you don't just need to be a physician in Navy medicine, but our research teams are constantly innovating and traveling around uh, the world to do so. Thanks for your question. Sandy is asking via Twitter, what surprised you most about your recent trip to Kenya? Sandy, uh, my recent trip to Kenya, what surprised me most about it? 
Oh, wow. I uh, was very surprised, one, by the level of respect and uh, uh, dignity that these people maintain in, uh, in such an impoverished area. It would not be uncommon to see a, uh, someone walking or running in a full suit and tie uh, surrounded by muddy areas and cows. And uh, also, I mentioned earlier, but the, uh, uh, the formalities in which they greet everyone who passes by them um, and how much that sense of community plays into their, their culture uh, was really eye-opening. And many times I uh, said, wow, you know, the American mentality of uh, you know, get it done, uh, very uh, individualized, is uh, much different over there where we have this great sense of community. In many ways, it reminded me of uh, uh, Navy community, Navy medicine structure in which we uh, are so intricately connected and uh, it's definitely a, a team mindset versus that of an uh, uh, individual. Thanks for that question. Uh, Melinda is asking, uh, continuing the discussion of Kenya, uh, she's asking what efforts do you see uh, being done locally to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS while you were there? Uh, Melinda, great question about HIV AIDS and the progress that's been made over the uh, past decade in HIV screening, uh, the education on what HIV AIDS is and how it's transmitted, uh, family planning, and uh, the help that's been given from pharmaceutical companies and from uh, numerous governments around the world to provide, uh, to provide the medicines. It's, it's outstanding. And USAID, in concert with uh, many others uh, around the world, these organizations, including uh, uh, the US Navy, have, have done a lot uh, towards educating people on this. The rates have gone from upwards of 40% down to less than 5%. It's really a, a, a remarkable uh, story on how um, how key education and provision of resources can help and really uh, you know, save lives. The, the trouble is now uh, you have a lot of orphans and taking care of them is what uh, I saw. There's numerous homes there uh, taking care of these kids that don't have parents and you see a lot of grandparents and aunts and uncles taking care of a large group of kids and uh, that's so so important. Michelle has a question about the military and the Navy's detailing system. Um, she wants to know how you became a resident of Camp Pendleton. Was this something you applied for or were you given orders to go there? Uh, so the whole detailing system in the Navy is, uh, is something where you, you try to get the best fit for, uh, for both parties involved. Obviously, there are needs of the Navy where uh, where there is water, where there are Marines, where there are sailors, uh, you're going to have a need to treat. So I'm not going to be able to go to the middle of the country. Uh, maybe another branch of the service might be better for that. Uh, my ability to be part of the family medicine program at Camp Pendleton was due to uh, my applying for that position and, uh, and getting accepted into it. And there are other family medicine programs that are tremendous. Uh, uh, Jacksonville, Florida has one. Pensacola, Florida. Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And also up in Birmingham, uh, Washington. And so uh, those are also optional programs that I could have done. Uh, many residents will train in, in uh, outside institutions and, uh, and then come back into the Navy and uh, serve their time as physicians. Continuing, uh, Michelle, I actually have a two-part question. She wants to know what the path to becoming a Navy medicine uh, professional is. So if you want to be part of the Navy medicine team, if you like what you're hearing and uh, you want to follow a, a path similar to me or similar to some flight surgeons out there or orthopedic surgeons or OBGYN docs or uh, you want to be a physician's assistant, a Navy nurse, a uh, Navy dentist, if you want to be part of the Navy healthcare team, the best thing to do is to go on to uh, Facebook and look at the Navy Medicine's page. Like it, uh, send a tweet to at Navy Medicine, and really get engaged with the conversation. 
uh, familiarize yourself with what Navy medicine is all about. And through that, you can find your local recruiter to talk to, <clears throat> and we'll set you up on the path to becoming a part of the Navy medicine team. Okay, and we've got time for one last question, and this one is from Eric in Los Angeles. One last question from Eric in Los Angeles, all right. Uh, he's very interested in Navy corpsmen and how long the EMT nursing process uh, for a corpsman would be. What does it take to make a Navy corpsman? So, uh, Eric, to become a Navy corpsman, uh, first, kudos for wanting to go that route. I think uh, Navy corpsmen are the, you know, they're the true heroes amongst us. They're the ones that are the most decorated, uh, people in the military and all of our history, they're out there uh, you know, right there on the battlefield taking care of our sailors and Marines. Uh, to do so, to become a corpsman, you enlist in the Navy and you go to Navy uh, Station Great Lakes and you go through boot camp and then you prorate once you take the uh, exams saying that you want to become a Navy corpsman. And then you'll go to core school, which is currently uh, taking place now down in San Antonio, Texas as a joint venture amongst all the military branches. And uh, after that, you differentiate on where you want to go, whether you want to be a, a corpsman as part of a dive team, if you want to be a corpsman uh, as part of a fleet marine force with the Marines, if you want to go on a ship, if you want to work in a hospital. Whatever you want to do, you state that and uh, pursue that route. And if you got any questions, you can always hit me up on Facebook or Twitter, I'm at Dr. Andy Baldwin, or go to the at Navy Medicine uh, Twitter handle, or go to the Navy Medicine Facebook page and ask away, and we'll get you where you want to go. That's one thing, I, I piece of advice I have for everyone, and it, I've sure learned it in the Navy, is if you want something, if you have a dream, go for it, ask for it, let it be known. Don't just expect that something's going to be given to you. And uh, I hope that you listening today, you've learned a, a bit more about the Navy medicine team. I had an incredible experience over in Kenya, uh, operating in an austere environment, learning uh, better ways and techniques to provide humanitarian assistance care. I'm grateful to uh, my family medicine program back there at Camp Pendleton uh, Marine Corps base at the hospital there in Southern California. I'm grateful for the Navy for giving me this opportunity and uh, I want to thank Captain Surrett and the folks at Chinfo for putting this on today. We apologize the server crashed. There were too many people you know, wanting to log on. So next time we got to increase our capacity. And uh, if you got more questions, we, uh, oh yes, one last thing. So coming up, it is Veterans Day. It's just a number of days away, and we're trying to reach 400,000 fans on our U.S. Navy Facebook page. So do us a big favor. We're close, and go online, go on Facebook, and like the U.S. Navy. Uh, I'm Navy Lieutenant Commander Andy Baldwin, uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C., and uh, it's been a pleasure being with you this afternoon. Thank you.